have to go here with proteins and nucleic acids. I think that um, for us, antibody has been a problem. We've had a couple of technologies that have, have uh, actually had companies ready to license and then a batch of antibodies change and the performance changes drastically. Um, that's been a big challenge for us. Um, so I think you need reliable supply of them. Yeah, I think small molecules, we can do it, but I'm not sure there's a really strong reason to do it. Also, small molecules often, <coughs> if you have an enzyme for them, an enzymatic system is good. I hope that. So can I just take mm -hmm. that to, I think, if I understood David's question uh, and uh, Phoebe's together, you actually have to test in a biological, which you did here in blood, mm -hmm. but David says it's inside the cell. It's not what's happening outside the cell, it's what's happening inside the cell. Mm -hmm. Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and in my, you know, <coughs> SWOT analysis last night, <laughs> oh, right, okay. of tech, you're doing drug delivery into, um, you know, in a targeted way, using nanotechnologies to get the things mm -hmm. So why can't you do targeted nanosensing? You can. Oh. Um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so I, if we went all the way, way <laughs> if I went all the way back, to the, that, yeah, you're going to get the talk again. Um, go back here. Inside the cell. We actually make nanoparticles, fluorescent nanoparticles, yeah. that go into the cell, right? And not only do we do that, we have developed a, a, a microscope method that, you know, if you think about most microscope images of particles or things in cells, they're static, right? And not only are they static, but you don't know whether it's moving or stuck somewhere. And of course, lots of them are stuck somewhere. So this microscope technique we've developed is, is basically it's a, what's called a pair correlation method. So if you imagine I have a particle over here, eventually it's going to be over here, right? And so we can, the microscope cameras are so good that you can monitor the fluctuation of fluorescence here, and that fluctuation has single particle resolution. But if something's fluctuating here and it goes to here, then these two signals must be correlated. And so then we can calculate how quickly they move across there or across barriers. So why that's it's important for drug delivery for saying where my particle goes and, and whether it where it delivers the drug. You can also, so for example, in this paper, in the paper, the 2000, 2017 paper there, we actually loaded the particle with doxorubicin, which is also fluorescent, and we asked the question: to get it into the nucleus, do you, what shaped particle do you need? And where is the best place to release the drug? And so what we showed in that paper is that you need rods. Rods go into nuclei much better than balls. And you need it to deliver it into the... You need the cargo to go all the way into the nucleus with the particle. Because you can imagine you release a whole lot into the cytoplasm. It's still going to go into the nucleus, so which is the better? And so that's... So you can do that sort of stuff. The question in... Um, for in relation to look, getting something inside a cell in a biological, you know, inside in the animal or in the person, is how do you deliver it to where you want? You know, this particle is going to go everywhere. I think that's a really unsolved challenge. I mean, that's really the drug delivery challenge. Most people are not really looking at the pharmacokinetics, or not that many people are looking at the, the transport time. People are trying to. We tried to actually apply for a, another set, center of excellence to do that, but the um, the panel in their wisdom did not think it was important. So, yeah. Just one supplementary question about what you just said. But if you were able to deliver it by direct injection into the middle of the tumor, the yes. system, don't you solve that problem? Come in? If you can do that. Yeah. And you can do that, I know. You can use it. So there's a beautiful technology by Rob Langer, who's one of the really, well, he's one of the people on the paper, which, you know, one of the biomaterials or bioengineering groups <coughs> from. Harvard, or, and if you want to see what he's like, there's a nature article, A Day in the Life of Rob Langer. That's pretty funny. Um, but what he, they've developed is a, a technology where you, in a biopsy needle, you actually have a, um, little wells that actually have little different cocktails of drugs in each well. They go into the cancer, it leaves the thing there, um, it delivers the drugs from the different wells, so, and then comes back and sees which drug is the most effective. That's pretty, that's pretty cool, right? So you can do that. I suppose what we were targeting here is early diagnostics before we know there's a, a tumour. Um, I think that, you know, even if you know there's a tumour, you'll cut it out, won't you? If you can. 
You've got a whole bunch of tumors, 50 of them inside. Oh, if you are, yeah. I'm not going to, Cunning's not going to do anything. Right. But I want to know what's the, the right cocktail stroke inside those nodules to drug X, which stimulates an immune response inside that. So I have an idea about that, which relates to the next thing yet, but I didn't cover that, but I'll cover, I'll talk about it. What I think the idea is, you tell me whether it's stupid or not. Let's move to that Okay. So actually it was not the next thing yet, it was the one after that. Um, but I can, we're running out, I think we're going. 102, yeah, go forward. I'll go four. Three's not so dissimilar from four, except it's how to make that nanopore experiment better. Um, and Yang Fang, who's sitting here at the front, is going to miss out on his great work. Um, but it's, it's not so different conceptually from the last one. So then the, we go to capture and release of rare cells. So this is, a, again, it's the same problem. It's something rare, but it's cells now. And it's in the bloodstream. And so the, the thinking, the what inspired us to think about this was, um, again, cancers and the so-called circulating tumor cells. And we were interested in this because it's a rare, an analytical challenge that's rare, but we were interested in, we think in a slightly different way to a lot of people at the time. So there's obviously a series of techniques to counting these cells. <coughs> so as you know, the cells leave the primary tumour, they go through the bloodstream, they then form secondary tumours somewhere else, and that's of course what most of us pass from. And so they're regarded as important diagnostic and prognostic indicators. But you're talking about one cell in a mill to 10 mils. So it's a really rare thing, one in a billion cells. But if you can count them, you can actually see how someone's responding to treatment, or you can sort of maybe see where the secondary cancer's coming about. Um, and if you could target them therapeutically, obviously that would be brilliant. And so there's a range of technologies around there that have been doing for quite a number of years now to count them. And they're based on either, uh, really they're based on two things, size, so this is a, um, a, a centrifugal device um, where um, the idea is that the cancer cell is bigger than the, than the healthy cell. And so as it spins around this thing, the cancer cells go out to the side um, and the smaller cells go on the inside leaf. And then you can separate cells. Um, developed in uh, Harvard and Singapore by a guy called C.T. Lim but the first author there, Majid Wakiani, is at UTS. Right? Um, and so it's saying cancer cells are bigger than non-cancer cells. That's its premise. And then there's the immunodevices, either microfluidic immunodevices or the Veridex cell search system, which is the FDA-approved way of counting these cells. And so what the Veridex cell search system does is it takes a magnetic nanoparticle. Only difference from what we did in many ways, I should have said that actually, the key difference what we do with magnetic nanoparticles and what most groups are do is most groups use them just to collect. We use them to generate the signal as well, and that gives us a whole lot of advantages. That's why we get really, really high detection, uh, low detection needs. So anyway, they take an anti, they take an antibody modified magnetic nanoparticle that's got an um, anti epithelial cell adhesion marker antibody on it, up regulated in circulating tumor cells. So we capture them. We bring them down to a microscope, we stain them with DAPI to make sure it's a cell, we stain them with cytokeratin, and we stain them with CD45 to make sure we can differentiate a leukocyte from a circulating tumor cell. And then we have an experienced operator that looks down and counts them. Now what's wrong, in my view, with both of these, um, or both these philosophies, is they say all circulating tumor cells are the same. Right? They're either all got up regulation of certain surface markers, or they're, or they're bigger. Um, and clearly, you know, that almost goes back to the old reductionist view of you can understand one cancer cell, you can understand all of cancer. And so, but how do you look at the heterogeneity? And how do you play with heterogeneity? Um, and there is no technology that was addressing that issue. And so we took the view that we can't compete with these. Some of these microfluidic devices are brilliant. You know, you could easily say, so can we make a surface, for example, that connects in with, say, this device and allows us to capture these rare cells and then individually release them, whatever, after we see them respond to a drug, for example. And so we developed a surface, it's a pretty sophisticated surface chemistry, but basically all we can think of, all you have to think of is, we have a surface with antibodies, 
So we're still using antibodies as, as, our, as our recognition system. So there could be a flaw in that, but you could use multiple different, you could use size and antibodies, or you could use different antibodies. We capture the cells on the surface, and here's the cells captured on the surface, and we look at it under a microscope. And we might say, expose those cells to drugs to see which ones respond and which ones don't. And then, after some time, we reduce the aperture of the microscope to just a single cell. We have a micro manipulator, and then we apply, we apply the light and potential, so it's voltage, if you think. The only area that's electrochemically active is where the light is, and so we have surface chemistry that's cleavable, and just cleaves off the surface. And rather than me to explain all that, here's an example. So this is a movie of us doing this. This is done in whole blood. You can see how good the surface chemistry is. You can see some red blood cells that really aren't stuck. We just didn't wash the surface. Students hate it. I show the one that's crude. We shine the light just on that guy. We bring the micro manipulator up. And you're going to see a lot of these red blood cells hoovered up first. Um, obviously, we could just wash the surface and they'll be going. And then we pick up that single cell. So that's just done in whole blood. So we pick up the, the single cell. So we thought that might be useful. So we can actually, um, we've already shown that we can look at different drug responses of cells on these surfaces and pick some up. We've shown we can also do it electrochemically to show that, um, for example, resistant cells, they're exporting the drug out more effectively, not stopping it going in. Um, and we can, we can pick that up electrochemically. And so we thought, could you use this to look at heterogeneity? Or if you start thinking about treatment regimes, so we're not going into the biopsy, but if we can clone these cells, we can now 3D print them. And we can take different collections of cells. I didn't talk about 3D printing technology. We can take different ratios of the different cells, but our 3D printing technology has 10 scan heads, so we can put different types of cells in a spheroid and see how that responds to treatment. So it wouldn't be quite the same as going to the tissue, but maybe, um, maybe it provides uh, something about treatment. So because you've got a whole wide field view of it. Mm -hmm. So you could, and we, what we've done in our is we've looked at resistant, we've made mixtures of resistant versus non-resistant yeah. cells. We can see from fluorescence which ones are resistant, which ones aren't, because the drug is fluorescent. But then we can also just pick up a subset of those. Um, I mean, I showed you here with a light aperture um, reduced down. But now what we do is we have, we've actually got this projector. Um, oh, here it is. We've got one of those projector lenses, and so what they've got is these, they've, they've got mirrors, right? And so they just shine, determine where the light goes. So we could look at the surface and say, those 12 cells we want, or those 27 cells we want, and turn on those pixels and release those ones, all in one go. So you could do that as well. <coughs> Not that we've done it, but in principle you could do that, yeah. Any questions from the scientific floor? I'm not generating all the discussion. <laughs> I'm failing. Alright, that brings us to the fifth one. Fifth one. So the fifth one's quite different. Um, and um, yeah, it's just repurposing your glucose meter. So the other, and this is not really about cancer per se, in our, in our test examples, it's about infection. It's about sepsis. But um, obviously if you're not looking at really, these technologies are really, this is also not as ultra sensitive like the other ones are. But obviously if we are applying these things to very early, uh, very low concentrations of cancer biomarkers, infection is the obvious area, to, other area where you really low amounts of material uh, apply. So I go back to, well, this is my fancy bit of graphics again, I'll ignore that. So I go back to these two guys. Glucose meter, wonderful technology, incredibly quantitative, um, but really incredibly selective to just one molecule. You change that enzyme, you think, well, now I can change the molecule. Glucose oxidase is one of the biggest tricks in the world. 
It's incredibly robust enzyme. You can store these, this enzyme you know, on your strip for a couple of years past the use by date. Um, there are, and obviously the market is enormous. There's, very f there's nothing else that has a market that compares with it, and very few enzymes are anywhere close to its stability. So you have a great technology, and I, and I should say, so this is the amount of money it costs to bring a device like this to market is about 100 million US dollars, which means the market needs to be about a billion dollar market. That's one of the reasons we don't have sensors for everything. It's just market. But obviously, this once you bring it to market, then this is incredibly versatile and robust piece of instrumentation. So. Any idea how many glucose measurements are done a day? Oh, God. There's a continuous monitoring now. Yes, yeah, sort of, for two weeks. Yeah, it's a lot less, but, but with these devices, this is the most successful analytical device in the world. You'd like to think it's a pH measure, it's what I was always told. It's ten to, more than a billion glucose assays done every single day. It's enormous. Um, so this device, but the problem is, of course, it can only do a small molecule. This device can do lots of proteins by, by changing the antibodies, but it's not very quantitative. Um, so can you get the best of both worlds? So what we're really trying to do is, can we turn a glucose meter into something that can measure antibody-antigen interactions? And so our idea is, and we're not the only people who have this idea, just change what the blue B is. My, my watch tells me it's time to travel. Um, so we just make a surface with antibodies for procalcitonin. So we were thinking of sepsis, thinking of it because you know we told that treating uh, you know someone has signs of sepsis, you don't know what it is. Not an easy way, quick way of knowing. If you wait more than an hour, ten percent chance of increase in mortality. Starts throwing in the antibodies or throwing uh, hitting them with drugs. So wouldn't it be great if you could monitor that quickly? And easily, so we can capture procalcitonin, we can have a second antibody and then a secondary antibody with a label, and our label is a bag full of glucose. That's all it is. Uh, in the first case, in the first test example I'll show you today, it's a, it's a liposome, but obviously you change the antibodies. It's a liposome full of um, glucose, but you change the antibodies. We have ideas on how to make a better label, but we want to see is this idea even viable and worthwhile. And then we just lyse the liposome, the glucose comes out, and we measure with that glucose meter. Pretty simple idea. Um, and you can start to envisage how you could use it. You can start to envisage how you could make a sort of little capsule that does all everything, and then you stick the glucose meter in at the end. Um, and so rather than show you go on and on and on about it, just know the basic idea. Here's our calibration curve in buffer and blood. You see blood has a little bit of a difference. I forgot to put the detection. Here is it showing procalcitonin versus the uh, some expected interferences. Of course, that's all down to the antibody, not to the technique. Um, we can detect 0.15 nanomole. So we, with this simple idea, we know that um, typically we need to detect about below about 0.24 nanomole, or according to the literature, is when you can say you've got sepsis. We know we have to avoid. Um, was it systemic inflammatory? Um, I forgot what the R stands for. Anyway, SIRS. Um, I know the acronym, um, which is about 0.08 nanomolar. So we know that if you don't have any sepsis, you're down below that. So we can detect 0.15 nanomolar um, in a few minutes using the glucose meter. Um, we think we need to get lower just because we think that's too close to where you have an issue um, and we have ideas how to amplify it. One would be a better glucose bag because the liposome is not ideal and it doesn't hold that much glucose. Um, but that's, that's the last bit yet. So that's completely different, that's right. completely pragmatic. Justin, we're going to go to Sydney, so we'll just uh, take one or two questions. Oh, I think we'll cross it. Oh, please, you can come back. <laughs> no, my watch told me. My thoughts told me what to do. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, my wife told me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my wife tells me my watch. My watch tells me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Any questions? Any questions at all?
either about this one or the or as a whole. Or so did so really back the whole talk is that I was at a meeting where somebody was talking about biomarker and said, and you alluded to that, that the the burden of proof of, of developing a biomarker is enormous. And enormous. The lead time is measured in years, if Correct. not a decade or two to go from that technology you've just shown us to an approval that this is now a biomarker that can be used in humans to predict whatever it is. That's right. And what is my solution to that? Yeah. I'm, so apart from the microRNA, which was really, we did that because someone really wanted to do it, and then it works humble, so much better than we ever expected, we only choose biomarkers that are approved already. Oh. That are already approved. So most of the things we... So most of the tests, actually, uh, prostate-specific antigens become almost a model for really sensitive technologies. You can compare most technologies using that. Most of the time we use that. Procalcitonin, obviously an approved biomarker. Um, I think that if you wanted to make a commercial device, you're a mug if you don't. Because you're either going to be the luckiest person alive, and you might have gone for the lottery, or, you, um, or, you, or you're wasting your time. Uh, so the, the, um, the, actually the magnetic nanoparticles and microRNA, as I said, we could use it for other things, but we actually worked with Richard Locke in the CCIA to look at uh, microRNAs, levels of microRNAs in tissues and in, in, in bodily fluids, rare ones to tell them about leukemia and effectiveness. Of, so it's really a discovery project, that's what it turns into. I mean, I think and that's sort of, I also alluded to that, that we shouldn't waste these technologies for So then you alluded to in an earlier uh, vignette you know, with microRNAs that you would use it for discovery. Correct. So how do you use the, the technology that, that started as a marker, but then how does that translate into a discovery project? So if you think about the, the, um, that microRNA yeah. technology, yeah. and you said, so how is, some, how is somebody responding to, to drug treatment? Or, and we want to quickly know that. We can give you the answer in 30 minutes rather than 12 hours. Um, we can look at a variety of them, so it's, and we can get really low, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's how you use the discovery is. It's having the right question and using that as the tool to answer the question. It's just a new tool that we didn't have before. Do you need that quickly? Do you need a response in, to know you're responding in half an hour? Is there a need? Is there a finger lead for that? Sepsis is it? Good example. Okay. A tumor treatment is not hard enough, but um, having to wait. Oh, it depends two on the weeks. Is mm. And I think it's also a cost element too. You know, if it's twelve hours and someone's spending twelve hours doing it, that's cost a lot more than someone's spending an hour doing. It. Mm. Any more questions? Obviously, I've stimulated a lot of thought. <laughs> I don't dull a lot of mine. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, it's, uh, I'm, a bit, I'm 10 minutes early, but uh, I can get you on the road to you sit quicker if you like. But if there are no more questions and you've completed the uh, five vignettes, then I'd like you to, uh, or you coming up to, uh, to, to say something. <laughs> What's that? Where you? Uh, you can brush it up. I just need to use the next um, the next level. Oh, well. Okay. Anyway, thanks, 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 Justin. Thank you. Thank you. by your brilliance, not because of your <laughs> in, a, in a facilitator. Uh, so for those of you who haven't met me, I'm Marco Chua. I'm a director of the Cancer Hematology Services here at uh, Prince of Wales Hospital. And uh, those of you who will be attending our uh, round tables uh, would know that uh, we have uh, a series of uh, such uh, events that are held uh, monthly at this particular center. And our next round table will be on uh, single cell <coughs> genomics. I'm not sure I'm talking to the right audience here. But uh, it will be presented by Chris Goodnell uh, and uh, facilitated by uh, Professor Tony Gara. So uh, I promise you there'll be another really exciting uh, round table that stretches beyond what we know in the uh, cancer hematology services. I don't see many cancer uh, clinicians here, but I think we very much encourage those of you and David, and I think we got somewhat to do to encourage our peers uh, to attend. And of course, uh, all of our 
uh, colleagues and potential collaborators from the uh, university will be very, very welcome uh, to attend. So I encourage you to stay if you've got time uh, just to have some discussions and uh, perhaps mingle with the peers to explore potential partnerships and uh, opportunities for collaboration because that's the ultimate driver why we establish this round table in, in the first instance to enable the collaboration, bringing people who wouldn't otherwise be in the same room together to be in the same room. You will have to put up with uh, Professor Gostin and me, but otherwise uh, feel free to, um, to uh, interact and uh, have that discussion. So thank you very much. We'll see you on uh, July 23rd. Okay, thank you. Thank you.